Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new EVD seminar. Uh, I am Maria Jose Ruiz. I'm, I'm going to be introducing our speaker today, and afterwards, Irene Mendoza will be leading the uh, will be moderating the questions. Uh, before I introduce the, our speaker, just a couple of reminders. If you need a certificate of attendance, please write down your name in the YouTube chat and then send an email to seminarios at evd.cesic.es. Uh, and regarding previous certificates of attendance, we are catching up with them. We were really busy and we'll try to have all of them sent uh, within the next week. And if you want to make questions to our speaker today, pre please write them down in the YouTube channel as well. And then Irene will formulate the questions when we finish, uh, when the talk is done. So our speaker today is Paco Garcia Gonzalez. He is, he is a researcher at the Doña, here at the Doñana Biological Station, and he is also an associate research fellow in the Center for Evolutionary Biology at the University of Western Australia. His research, uh, it broadly, uh, <clears throat> his research interests broadly encompass evolutionary ecology of uh, sex, uh, select, sexual selection, and he is going to tell us a little bit about that today. So, Paco, whenever you are ready, you can start. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation to give this seminar. It, it is a real pleasure to have uh, this opportunity. So today I'm going to be talking about some aspects in relation to the evolutionary ecology of sexual interactions, and I will mainly use my own work to navigate through these aspects. So I will provide an overview of some of the research that I, together with my research group and collaborators, have carried out over the last 12, 15 years or so. But before that, uh, a brief, a brief biograph biography. I'm sorry, it's not uh, responding to the slides. Give me a sec. All right. Okay. Uh, so I'll say in a, a brief biography. I did my PhD uh, on the evolution of paternal care in this interesting insect, the golden egg bug, and I did it at the Natural Sciences, Sciences Museum in Madrid. And at the end of it, I applied for a fellowship to go to the University of Western Australia for, for two years. And I was lucky to get this fellowship. But what was going to be two years in Australia became 10 years because once there, I was also lucky to get some funding, mainly from the Australian Research Council and some positions at the University of Western Australia and the Center for Evolutionary Biology. And during all this time in Australia, back in Spain, my family and friends were always thinking that I was working on iconic Australian animals, things like uh, koalas, kangaroos, beautiful birds, and so on. But I was instead working on uh, less glamorous, but uh, equally interesting animals, very good model systems too. Things like uh, uh, fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster here, mealworms here at the top. Uh, they are these beetles, dung beetles, crickets, sea urchins, mussels, and the like. And in 2012, I came back to Spain to Doña, Doñana Biological Station. And so at this time I thought, okay, now it is, it is a, a real good opportunity for me to start working on real emblematic animals. And, and I managed to do it. And here they are. Well, I don't know if you can see them. I need to enlarge this picture. They are here. Yes, sweet beetles. So at least they are emblematic of uh, sexual conflict research. Yeah, and it's a very interesting uh, model system. Uh, uh, I'll talk about them a little bit later on. All right. So. The research I'm gonna be talking about today has to do with both ecology and evolution. And uh, so ecology is about interactions, but these interactions, for instance, among the species in a community uh, are determined to a large extent by the evolutionary history of the players, all right? On the other hand, evolution takes place within the ecological theater that Hutchinson uh, referred to. And the title of his book said it all, The Ecological Theater and the Evolutionary Play. So ecology and evolution are intertwined. We cannot understand one without the other. And this ecological theater, this ecological context applies uh, uh, not only to interspecific interactions, but also to intraspecific interactions. And within these interactions, but to sexual uh, interactions. Uh, and these this interactions, sexual interactions are paramount in sexually reproducing species because at the end of the day, offspring production and therefore finish is contingent on access 
uh, to members and gametes of the other sex. So, and this implies a strong selective forces operating on these kind of interactions. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, sexual selection in general. I'm going to be talking a little bit about sexual conflict, about the evolution of female multiple mating, bed hedging strategies, a little bit on experimental evolution. And if we have time also, uh, I'll be talking about transgenerational effects. But before that, I think it's important to give a brief overview of some relevant concepts starting uh, by uh, sexual selection. Sexual selection is selection for access to members and gametes of the other sex, okay? It's a selection that centers around reproduction and it's one of the main engines of biodiversity and, and evolution at the, uh, between species levels, here at the top, and at the within species levels, here at the bottom. And traditionally, two mechanisms of sexual selection were recognized. Uh, competition among the members of one sex, generally males, for access to the other sex, the females, and mate choice, generally female mate choice. But now we know that sexual selection continues beyond mating because in many species, females mate with multiple mates within the same reproductive cycle. We call this polyandry, female polyandry. And the extent and implications of female polyandrous behavior change our understanding of sexual selection because for a start, uh, polyandry implies that for males, mating success doesn't translate, doesn't mean reproductive success. And this is a great deal, okay? After copulations, or after copulation, males maybe still need uh, to compete with other males for the fertilization of the ova. After copulation, females maybe still bear some paternity towards some specific males. So, sexual selection is also about these two mechanisms of post copulatory sexual selection sperm competition and post copulatory female choice. We call this cryptic female choice. The bottom line is that sexual selection deals with variation in two fundamental components of reproductive success mating success and fertilization success. And this latter component is what really translates into, into offspring production and therefore fitness. And as such, sexual selection deals with the evolution of traits determining mating success, but it also generates strong selection operating at the post level. And these are examples from some studies that I have carried out in collaboration with my colleagues. And they serve to illustrate that post sexual selection shapes many traits in males and females. Things like uh, uh, ejaculate quality or sperm morphology, behaviors such as uh, mate guarding or male strategic investment into ejaculate, uh, interactions between males and females, social diagrammatic level, and so on. And many of these uh, adaptations, okay, are possible or arise because of post sexual selection. And, and the main a uh, consequence of polyandry is that it opens the door to this selection, post-copulatory sexual selection. And here I just want to clarify one thing. When I'm talking about polyandry, I'm not referring to females monopolizing males. Simply refer I'm simply referring to females mating with multiple males within the same reproductive cycle. And this is a very common behavior. It's, a, it's a taxonomically widespread. And it happens in socially monogamous uh, species as well. If we focus, for instance, on socially monogamous bird species, we find that in more than 70% of these species, females engage in extra population. So females are polyandrous. And this gives an idea of how common polyandry is uh, in nature. But this is a kind of a mystery, a, a conundrum, because polyandry shouldn't be that common, theoretically, for a series of reasons. First, one copulation normally gives a female enough sperm to fertilize uh, her complete set of ova. Second, mating is costly in terms of energy, in terms of uh, contracting uh, sexually transmitted diseases, for instance. And third, females are expected to maximize reproductive success with just one or a few matings. And this is a very important point, and it is, it is worth that we spend some time talking here about the basis of sexual differences. So what are the differences between the sexes? Well, in strict sense, the sexes are defined according to the size of their gamut. So if we went to the field and found a new species with two kinds of individuals, one producing a small but numerous gametes and the other producing fewer but larger gametes, we will call the first kind of individual male, the second one we will call it female. And this is it, enough to define the sexes. But what is important is that this simple inequality in the size and number of sexes has a huge implications for the uh, differences that we see in the adults. And we just need to think about, for instance, parental investment. The, the ovum typically provides 
half the genetic material of the zygote, but also the machinery and the nutrients needed to nourish the developing embryos. And in contrast, the sperm contribution is limited to the DNA containing amino sets. And this initial asymmetry in parental investment is frequently extended to subsequent stages of offspring development, okay? And uh, we just need to think about the, uh, the typical mammal species, all the, all the females, I'm sorry, all the animals here, the other animals are females as we know. Second, we need to, to think about competition for resources. Asymmetries in gamete numbers implies that the limiting resource for fertilizations are the females or the ova, and that males or their sperm need to compete for fertilization. And then we need to think about potential reproductive rates. Males produce astronomical numbers of gametes and invest generally little in the offspring, and therefore they can increase, in theory or theoretically, they can increase their reproductive success, okay, as they increase the number of matings with different mates. Right, but it, females are more limited, okay, because they of the production of fewer gametes and higher maternal investment. So differences in potential reproductive rates. In other words, females are expected to maximize reproductive success with just one or few mates. But as I said, polyandry is quite common in nature. Why is it so common? Well. Aside and non adaptive explanations, it is clear that females can obtain direct benefits from mating with multiple males. And we call them direct benefits or material benefits. So they can obtain, for instance, nutrients from uh, male accopulation, uh, what we call nuptial gifts, or they can ensure the fertilization of the ova. And this, uh, this review here from some years ago showed that the rates of infertile mating due to male fertility problems are actually quite high in natural populations. So females can actually ensure the fertilization of the ova by mating with multiple mates. But females can also obtain indirect benefits. They can obtain genetic benefits, benefits that are manifested in the offspring, okay? So for instance, polyandrous females can increase the genetic quality of their offspring by filtering out unsuitable males through post sexually selective mechanisms if say or imagine that embryo uh, quality is determined by an interaction between parental genotypes, okay? This is the genetic incompatibility hypothesis. But females can also obtain good genes uh, for their offspring by mating with multiple males. Okay, and there is, there is good uh, support uh, for these two kinds of hypotheses. Uh, for instance, in this study, we show that uh, embryo viability is determined by interaction between parental genomes. But in contrast, in, in dumb beetles here, they support for good genes. The same is true in, the, in, the, in, the, in this cricket species where we found that there, there are intrinsic side effects contributing to embryo viability. So the message that I want to get across here is that at present, there is little doubt that the, at post copulatory sexual selection due to paternity bias and mechanisms is paramount to explain female mating rates and consequently, post sexual selection is frequently invoked in the study of the evolution of polyandry. But, and this is something that frequently goes unnoticed, post-copulatory post sexual selection can only operate if polyandry is already in place. And there's another interesting mechanism, this is hedging, bed hedging, which may underlie variation in female mating frequency. So we are gonna be talking about bed hedging a little bit now. What is bed hedging, okay? Well, this is uh, Daniel Bernoulli, Swiss mathematician who long time ago uh, wrote a very influential paper on church behavior under risk and suggested or concluded that it is advisable to divide goods which are exposed to some danger into several portions rather than to risk them all together. In other words, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And this uh, risk spreading strategy applies not only to goods or money, but also to evolutionary fitness. A, don't put all your eggs in one basket strategy uh, uh, may work because it protects against uh, complete failure. So we, we are trained to think that selection works to, to maximize uh, mean fitness, okay? So we tend to think, and most of the times we will be right in thinking this, the fittest individuals are those that produce on average uh, the highest number of offspring. But selection can also work to reduce the variance in fitness, especially in the face of fluctuating environments. And John Gillespie was the first to formalize 
uh, but had in a theory in, a, in an evolutionary framework, uh, evolutionary context. And the classic example of a hedging is delayed germination in desert annual plants. These plants have a single season to grow and reproduce, and therefore their reproductive success is highly contingent on whether the conditions for growth and reproduction are good or bad when the seeds germinate. Okay, if it's been a rainy year, a wet year, that is fine. But if, if it's been a dry year, all the plants germinate in that year will have zero fitness. Therefore, in highly fluctuating environments, selection has favored the evolution of a bed hygiene strategy whereby germination is spread over multiple seasons. That is, only a fraction of the seeds of any plant germinate in any given year. And in this way, the risk of complete reproductive failure is minimized. So, fitness uh, won't be too high in any generation, but it won't be too low across generations either. So there is a reduction in the valency fitness leading to a higher uh, long-term fitness, leading to an increase in the cross-generational fitness, which is evolutionary fitness. I'm gonna repeat this. There's a reduction in the valency fitness leading to an increase in long-term fitness. And this, uh, the mathematical basis underlying this is that we need to measure evolu evolutionary fitness using a geometric mean and not an arithmetic mean. Imagine, that we have three genotypes, A, B, and C, and we want to measure their fitness uh, uh, across three generations. As in fitness, as in number of hosting, for instance, produced. But so we have genotype A with high fitness in generation one, high fitness in generation two, but zero fitness in generation three. We have genotype B with high and low fitness values across generations. And then we have genotype C with more or less intermediate values, okay, across generations. So th the first conclusion from this example is that we cannot calculate uh, evolutionary fitness using the arithmetic mean, in this case, 60 plus 90 plus zero divided by three, because we would conclude that genotype A is the fittest, but this is not true. It cannot be true because we know that genotype A became extinct in generation three. So we need to use the geometric mean, which is the nth root of the product of n scores, in this case, it's the cubic root of the product of these three uh, scores. And we need to use the geometric mean because it takes into account the multiplicative nature of fitness across generations. And the second conclusion is that the geometric mean has a property of accounting for the risk associated to having high variance in the fitness scores. In this example, for instance, uh, we see that genotype C is the fittest, even though it doesn't maximize fitness in any given generation. And we see that genotype B is prone to extinction in some generations, maybe due to some stochastic effects, for instance, here in generation two. And this high variance is penalized by, by, by the geometric mean. So two points to highlight. Pet hedging is a strategy that is neither optimal nor a failure across all environments reproductive about generations. And bed hedging protects against stochasticity and environmental fluctuation by reducing variance in fitness over generations at the expense of sacrificing fitness in any, any, any given generation. And this is the essence of bed hedging. And bed hedging responses have been invoked in the evolution of many traits, uh, including offspring numbers, offspring size, timing of germination, etc. But uh, empirical tests of these ideas are, are quite rare. And this also applies to a special case of female multiple mating. Female multiple mating as a hedging strategy is a strategy that would deal with sampling errors arising from the inability of females to discriminate male quality or with the unpredictability of the future environmental conditions that the offspring will experience. And there are two behaving related hypotheses. The first one, uh, the genetic uh, behaving hypothesis suggests that by mating with multiple males, females reduce the risk of having older offspring side by a, by a male of low genetic quality, simply because they are sampling more males. Okay, imagine this female is trying to decide with whom she should mate to uh, maximize fitness, increase the genetic quality of their offspring, and she decides to mate with these four males so that a broader sampling of the males in the population solves the problem by its own. Then we have the genetic diversity behaving hypothesis, suggesting that due to the diversity of paternal genotypes in the offspring of a polyangiose female, the likelihood that at least some offspring will survive in a changing environment is higher than when offspring genotypes are less diverse. That is when females mate monogamous. Okay, that makes sense, okay? But as I said, empirical tests of these ideas are rare because they are, these tests are difficult 
to be implemented. For instance, in this particular case, we will need to compare the fitness of females behaving monandrously or polyandrously across generations. But ideally, we should use same females mating both ways. But this, of course, is difficult or impossible in many cases. It will entail many confounding factors, for instance, female aging effects, mating order effects, and so on. And maternal effects could also be an additional confounding factor because females can allocate more resources to offspring when they are mating mon monandrously than when they are mating polygamously or vice versa. And it will, in any case, it will be difficult to disentangle the hedging benefits from those due to sexual selection, that is paternity biasing mechanisms, because as soon as females mate with multiple males, uh, paternity biasing mechanisms kick in. But that said, a few years ago, we uh, overcame these constraints in an in a empirical study that we did on a sea urchin species using artificial fertilization, artificial insemination. So we exploited the fact that we were working in an externally fertilizing species and apply both monandrous and polyandrous matings to the same females. Okay, so in this, in this species, females produce thousands of eggs. So we split the eggs of a female into several batches, fertilize some of these batches with sperm from one male monogamously, some of the other batches with sperm from, from three males polygamously. And then we followed embryo ability. We replicated this at different levels uh, uh, and simulated different generations. And we were able to calculate geometric mean fitness of both mating strategies. So this design allowed us to answer this question. What if we could ever measure in nature same females following different mating strategies across generations? And I'm not gonna delve into the results, but I just wanna say that uh, we found that there is a scope for a polyandrous strategy to prevail over a monogamous strategy due to genetic and genetic diversity benefits derived from a pure bed hedging mechanism. And so this is nice, but we know from previous studies, including modeling work uh, done by Yuki Yasui here, that the evolution of polyandry via bed hedging is unlikely in large populations. And that, but, but that said, Yuki Yasui and I uh, recently revisited the theoretical basis for bed hedging polyandry and found that uh, uh, bed hedging can promote the evolution of polyandrous behavior in subdivided populations, that is populations with a spatial structure. And this is true when rates of parental uh, genetic uh, incompatibilities are pervasive in the population or when rates of infertile matings due to male fertility problems are high in the population, a phenomenon that we know is high as I commented earlier. So there is certainly scope for behaving to promote the evolution of polyandry behavior in subdivided populations. And these results uh, are not only important for the evolution of polyandry, but also uh, uh, for conservation biology, because populations of many endangered animals are frequently subdivided, okay, with individuals scattered among small populations that are more or less interconnected through migration. And our results uh, suggest that behaving polyandry can delay the extinction of such populations. All right, so this is nice, but these are theoretical results. And I wanted to go a step further. I wanted to test whether empirical data supported this, this uh, theory. And for this, I thought that e experimental evolution could uh, offer the right tool. Experimental evolution in the context of sexual selection research typically consists of protocols in which the opportunity for sexual selection is uh, uh, manipulated or removed. And you might be familiar with this classical example by Brett Holland and William Rice, in which they remove uh, sexual selection by enforcing monogamy in some populations of uh, fruit flies, the Sophila melanogaster, for several generations. And so Lee Simmons and I, together with the help of Maxine Lovegrove, applied this uh, very same approach to study sexual selection in, in dung beetles. So we remove uh, sexual selection by enforcing monogamy in three populations. At the same time, we kept three populations as controls uh, under our polygamous mating systems with sex, sexual selection going on. In the monogamous population, each male mates with one female, each female mates with one male, so there's no sexual selection. And 21 generations following the removal of sexual selection, the results show the power of uh, uh, sexual selection to shape many traits in uh, males and females, for instance, Pesticides here in blue was reduced in males from the uh, monogamous populations compared to the males from the polygamous populations. 
and fertilization success was higher for the males from the polygamous population. So evidence for the evolution of pesticides and sperm competitiveness in response to sexual selection. In this other study, we combined experimental evolution and uh, selection analysis and, and found evidence for the evolution of male genital morphology in response to sexual selection. So we found that uh, uh, males on the polygamous lines exhibited a uh, longer and thinner ideagus, that is the intermittent organ in males. Uh, so uh, thinner and longer ideagus than monogamous males or males from the monogamous lines, I should say. And this shape also confers uh, higher mating success. And in this other study, we combined experimental evolution and quantitative genetic brain designs and found evidence uh, supporting the existence of IT genetic variants in female genital morphology. And also uh, uh, we found that male and female genital morphologies uh, co-vary. Uh, they they, they co-evolve, they vary in concert, all right? And so these results are also uh, important because the evolution of female genital morphology has received hardly any attention today. In combination, these uh, three studies show the power of sexual selection, but also the power of experimental evolution to assess the power of sexual selection. But if you remember, back to the hedging, uh, we wanted to test whether increased female mating rates are favored in especially structured populations due to bear hedging benefits. And for this, I recur to bear hedging. So uh, uh, we carried in, in, in our lab, to the best of my knowledge, the first uh, experimental evolution approach in which the selection treatment differs in whether there is population, spatial structure, population subdivision, in addition, in addition to mating system variation. So a few years ago, together with Eduardo Rodriguez, a PhD student in the, in the group, uh, we set up a, a selection experiment using uh, seed beetles here. And so we set up a uh, or impose a selection treatment dealing with a metapopulation subdivision. From our same population, we derive eight lines, we call them metapop metapopulation lines, that are each subdivided. And at the same time, we, we uh, uh, derive eight controlled populations, undivided populations. And each metapopulation line consists of five subpopulations that are uh, interconnected through migration, 20% migration rates. And uh, population sizes were kept at 25 males and 25 females per line and generation. But importantly, this is a, a two by two crossing design because from a start, we superimpose another, another selection treatment. In this, case, in this case, dealing with mating system variation. So half the lines were uh, kept under uh, monogamy. The other half of the lines were kept under polygamy, right? In the polygamous lines, sexual interactions uh, are, are possible were allowed among all the, all the individuals in the population or subpopulation. Sub so this is sexual selection. Males need to compete with other males for access to the females, for fertilization. Females can choose mates and so on. There is sexual selection. In the monogam monogamous populations, enforced monogamy effectively reduces or removes uh, sexual selection, okay? Altogether, there is no sexual selection. All right. So this is the material we have in our lab. Four lines of beetles. Uh, without uh, population structure, no population subdivision, um, with an evolutionary history of monogamy that is without sexual selection going on, four lines of beetles uh, without sexual selection, okay, and but there is population structure, population subdivision, four lines of beetles uh, without structure, but with, with an evolutionary history of sexual selection, sexual selection is present, four lines of beetles with sexual selection present and a structure present. And as today, uh, the selection experiment has been going for over 90 generations. And so with this material, we tested for divergence in female mate, uh, mating rates, female remating rates, uh, using the females from the selection lines when they have different opportunities to mate with males, standardized males, uh, that they are coming from a near isogenic line, okay? And so uh, here are the results. The results inform that uh, neither the mating system selection history nor the population structure selection uh, treatment or the interaction had an influence of female remating rates, uh, the propensity of females to remate, a remating interval and so on. So no support for this theory. So either the theory is uh, nonsense or something else is going on. 
And I suspect a couple of things are going on, actually. If you remember, I said that we impose 20% migration rates among the different subpopulations in the metapopulation lines. And this migration rate is, is probably allowing, allowing a great deal of gene flow and therefore preventing to a large extent selection for a biohygiene strategy. And in fact, the theoretical results say, or in, uh, they don't say, they indicate or suggest that the higher the connectivity between subpopulations, the smaller the potential for bad hygiene derived benefits. And if you remember, another critical factor favoring the evolution of uh, polyandry via bad hygiene is the risk of complete reproductive failure due to male fertility problems. So we actually checked uh, rates of infertile matings in the lines and the treatments, and we found that these rates were really low. They are below 3% in, in all the 16 lines, and there are no differences between the lines in, in the infertile uh, mating rates. So it is not a surprise that we, we didn't find uh, any effect on, uh, uh, on, may, on the evolution of human mating frequency in this particular test and in this particular system. But the, the selection experiment in our lab is also useful for other tests. And in reality, it was also designed to test for the, uh, the role of metapopulation structure in uh, sexual conflict. And in this, uh, in this context, I've got some, some results to tell you about, but first we need to talk about sexual conflict. Uh, sexual conflict. In sexually reproducing species, males need females, females need males, but the sexes rarely have the same agenda when it comes to reproduction. The reproductive interests of males and females only converge under genetic monogamy, but genetic monogamy is quite rare in the animal kingdom and some kind of conflict is, is rise, is common. If you remember this graph, uh, males, we said that males can increase their reproductive success as they increase the number of matings with different mates because males produce uh, many gametes, they invest little in the offspring, but this is not true for females because they are more limited by the production of fewer gametes and a higher parental investment. The bottom line is, the, is that the optimal number of mating partners may differ for males and females. And this generates uh, sexual conflict, sexual conflict over mating rates, okay? And this is a common conflict and it's just, just one, of, one of them. So sexual conflict generally favors the evolution of traits in one sex that increases the reproductive success of that sex at the expense of the other sexes. Fitness and the archetypical example of uh, sexual conflict is, is Drosophila melanogaster. In this species, males modify female behavior and physiology for their own interests at mating. Okay, so mating reduces female receptivity to further matings, and, and mating also decreases uh, quite dramatically female lifespan. And these effects are caused by the, by the transfer of toxic seminal fluid by males at copulation. Another example of sexual conflict happens in the seed beetles that we have in our lab. They're called Calosobrucus maculatus. And in this species, uh, males exhibit this very spiny uh, genitalia, which serve, serves the male to gain control over the mating interaction, but at a cost for female fitness. And interestingly, sexual conflict frequently leads to the uh, uh, sexually evolution, antagonistic evolution. And uh, what is this? So uh, this is when, when male manipulative strategies, okay, uh, lead to the evolution of a resistance in the other sex, creating this kind of uh, cycles, that this escalating coevolutionary arms um, races between the sexes that we, we call uh, that way, sexual antagonistic coevolution. And there is uh, ample support for this kind of coevolution. For instance, from that study that uh, I commented before by Holland and Rice, in which they removed sexual selection in some populations of fruit flies. So because they remove sexual selection, they remove sexual conflict, the opportunity for sexual conflict. And after 47 generations following the removal of sexual selection and conflict, they found that males became more benign to females. And consequently, that females became less resistant to uh, the males, okay? Similar support also in the other system, uh, seed beetles, uh, from a, a, a comparative point of view, for instance, in this study, they found that the skinnier the male genitalia, the thicker the female genital tract, also support that the within species level, uh, in, in short, um, female resistance 
is associated to the level of, of male harm. All right, so we know a great deal about sexual conflict now, and we also know that uh, it's got very important evolutionary consequences, for instance, for population viability and extinction. And, and we are also starting to realize that ecology plays an important role in sexual conflict evolution. Metapopulation structure is, is one such critical ecological and demo demographic factor, but it is hardly uh, uh, so it's, it's surprising because we know hardly nothing about the role play by metapopulation structure on sexual conflict uh, dynamics. And this is surprising because metapopulation structure is, is common in nature. And so I think our, our selection experiment, uh, our experimental evolution uh, approach in our lab uh, could shed some light into this question because, so if you remember, some studies before have manipulated mating system uh, uh, selection history, but ours is the first with which we can assess the independent and interacting effects of selection associated with mating system and a spatial structure on adaptation to and the consequences of sexual conflict. And with this in mind, I'm gonna be talking about the evolution of female resistance, which we measure by looking at the fitness of experimental females while mating to test their, just to test their males. Males coming from outside the selection experiment, they are males that are coming from uh, near isogenic lines. And so we carried several essays at different times, different generations. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, three of these experiments. One looking at female longevity under variable female mating rates. Another looking at female longevity after single mating. But we also need to look at baseline longevity that is longevity of females when they are virgins because female longevity may intrinsically differ for the different females from the different selection lines or selection regimes. So we need to look at, at, at the longevity when they are virgins without the effects for male harassment and the mating. And first of all, I need to tell you that there was no divergence in baseline longevity. So all the effects that uh, we are gonna see are attributable to female resistance. And when we control for uh, female mating frequency and, and we focus on uh, uh, undivided populations here in red, okay, the, the results support completely supported the predictions from uh, sexual conflict theory. In these populations, and divided populations, polygamous females, polyandrous females, who are expected to evolve higher resistance to the damaging effects of mating and the male adaptations that are pushed in the polygamous population. So these females actually live longer than monogamous females when both kinds, both kinds of females mate with standardized males. So polygamous females are more resistant yeah, and enforced monogamy, that is the experimental removal of sexual selection, led to the evolution of less resistant females. As I said, supports previous findings, including those by Holland and Rice, but also others. But remember, what makes our study unique is that we set up a selection uh, treatment dealing with population subdivision, and that we can therefore study the interaction between mating system selection history and selection history associated to uh, 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 population structure, population subdivision. And what happens when we look at subdivided populations? We find that uh, the pattern is reversed. So monogamous females live longer than polygamous females when both uh, kind of females made to standardized males. So the, the pattern is reversed. And this, and this uh, um, interaction is, uh, well, controls, a statistical analysis control for, for female body size, um, and, and many other things, generation, the uh, mating frequency, and across generations, the pattern is also quite consistent, as you can see here at the top. And the pattern is also apparent in the single mating essays, although uh, here at the bottom, although uh, in this case it's not significant. But there is something going on. What is going on? We don't know for sure. But we know that in the context of uh, metapopulation ecology, small populations can act as refugees for less competitive genotypes or strategies. So could it be that less resistant females or less aggressive, competitive, or manipulative males can persist for longer in metapopulations? Can it be that sexual conflict and sexually antagonistic, antagonistic selection is less intense in metapopulations? So we don't know. We are working on these possibilities. But so far, what uh, uh, our results show is that population spatial structure moderates sexual selection and conflict in unexpected 
ways, and more broadly, that ecology has critical effect on sexual conflict evolution. And uh, these results are important to understand sexual conflict evolution, but they also have implications for uh, conservation biology, population dynamics, and also biological control, because we are working on a, on a, on a pest species, an, an insect that is a, is a pest of uh, grain. I wanted to briefly mention as well that another line in, in our group uh, is looking at whether this uh, interaction between these two uh, evolutionary histories, evolutionary history in relation to mating system or spatial uh, or metapopulation structure and their interaction, we are looking at whether these histories, this selection shapes uh, the architecture of social sexual networks or the ability of individuals to shape their social environment, what we call social niche construction. And this research is being done by a PhD student, David Quevedo, and uh, he gave a very interesting seminar a couple of years ago. And so I'm not gonna say anything else about, about this. But now I'd like to move into the last section of the talk, which is about transgenerational effects of sexual interactions. And there is a nice transition between this section and the previous section, sexual conflict, because a key question in sexual conflict research that is generally overlooked is whether uh, sexual conflict is really a conflict. And for this, we need to look at the intergenerational and the transgenerational consequences of sexual interactions. So in order to assess sexual conflict, we need to know whether the direct cost for females of mating with males that are attractive but manipulative are compensated this cost by indirect benefits, okay? So maybe these females mating with uh, irresistibly attractive but manipulative males, harmful males, are compensated uh, if, if the offspring of uh, these males in, inherit the, the attractiveness of their fathers and therefore females can increase their, their reproductive success, their fitness through their offspring. So maybe we shouldn't call anything sexual conflict until we know for sure what is the net balance of sexual interactions. And for this, we need to study the transgenerational consequences of sexual interactions. And there might be also no genetic inheritance at play, as we will see. As, uh, this study on cricket was uh, illustrative uh, because we, we found that the direct cost for females of mating with, with attractive good quality males in terms of a reduction of female longevity were compensated by the production or by indirect benefits in the form of the production of offspring with higher viability. So what we will call a direct, uh, sorry, what we will call a, a, a sexual conflict from the point of view of the direct cause in the females, it is no sexual conflict when cross-generational effects are taken into account. And we also need to, to, to look at not only the direct cause and indirect benefits, but also the, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know if I said indirect or direct, we need to move beyond looking at direct costs and indirect genetic benefits. We also need to look at indirect costs. And in this uh, study led by Damian Dowling, now at Monash University in Melbourne, we found, working under Sophie Melanogaster, that exposure by females to increased levels of uh, uh, sexual interactions in, in, in the sense or in terms of increased uh, male harassment led to the production of uh, offspring with reduced longevity, reduced survival. So sexual interactions can lead to intergen intergenerational, non-genetically transmitted costs too. The same we found in this other study in Sid Beatles in, in this case, led by Susie Saichek. She was here uh, doing a postdoc uh, the AVD a few years ago. And so we found very large transgenerational costs of sexual harassment in these Beatles. And in this figure shows the multiplicative thinness uh, over three generations. So the number of offspring they produce over three generations for females mating uh, singly, that is monogamously, for females mating multiply, polygamously or polyandrously, uh, or females mating uh, singly, but with additional levels of uh, sexual harassment. And so we can see actually the very large transgenerational cost of, of this uh, uh, harassment. And these results, align well uh, with the notion that males can make a big difference for offspring phenotype and fitness aside father offspring gene transmission. And in this context, ejaculate-driven transgenerational effects are uh, emerging as important uh, candidates, important players. And, and 
actually in this other study in, in the cricket system, we actually found this kind of uh, ejaculate driven transgenerational effects. We use a, a morphological marker having to do with, with eye color, okay, uh, that can be identified midway through embryo development. So it is a very simple tool, but very powerful tool, okay, with which we can determine paternity of the embryos by different males that are mated to a same female. So very simple uh, uh, morphological marker, but uh, a very powerful tool. And using this tool, we were able to uh, find that males that intrinsically confer high embryo viability on their offspring are also able to enhance the viability of offspring within the same clutch that uh, are sired by other males. And, and paternal, uh, sorry, ejaculate driven effects are, are good candidates for this paternal effects and non side influences on the phenotype of the next generation. And uh, further support for this comes from this nice study, uh, more recent study uh, carried out by Lee Simmons and Maxine Lovko, in which they use the same uh, system, this cricket species, but they use uh, castrated males, so males that can only transfer seminal fluid to the females. And they find actually what, what this graph is showing, that there is variation in the seminal fluid donor ID in the way they influence embryo uh, viability, okay, of embryo side by other males that are mated to the same female. So uh, very good support for, for non-genetic paternal effects via the seminal fluid and also results that have uh, important implications for quantitative genetics, for instance, because they imply that estimates of ID genetic variance underlying embryo viability may be inflated uh, by this uh, paternal effect. And these results in, in this uh, system and the other systems align well with, with, with what we have found in a, in a, a general review that we carried out uh, recently as well. Uh, it was led by, by John Evans. And so we did it across research systems and across disciplines. And we found that the ejaculate is a central vehicle for non-genetically transmitted effects. And so evidence that the father's environmental experiences shape the phenotype of their Offspring is, is uh, rapidly accumulating and in, from many systems, I mean, many systems from, from insects to humans. And this, this influences these paternal effects can be based on epigenetic uh, mechanisms here, or they can be due to the non-sperm fraction of the ejaculate, and they can affect uh, uh, offspring directly or through the mother, okay? And as environmental experiences, we can have uh, paternal diet, paternal lifestyle, exposure by fathers uh, to drugs and toxins, mm, social experiences, and so on. And, and, and all these uh, experiences by the fathers are known to affect a range of offspring phenotypes, including viability, behavior, body size, metabolism, fecundity, health, longevity, and so on. So it is clear that there are paternal effects responsible for, for the transmission of biological information aside the transmission of DNA sequence. But there's a lot of work to do, uh, for instance, in the context of looking at the economics of sexual interactions. Uh, as I was mentioning before, we need to not only look at the direct benefits and the direct costs or indirect benefits, we also need to look at the indirect costs, which may be also born from this transgenerational effect. And we need more studies uh, into the environmental uh, triggers of these effects. We need, of course, more studies into the, the mechanisms. Uh, there is a lot of research going into this direction actually now. Uh, we need more, of course, but there is a huge gap in terms of the evolutionary implications of these effects. And I just wanted to finish saying that in our lab, we are also interested in intergenerational effects from a general point of view, not only from, from the point of view of sexual interactions. And uh, so uh, Ivan Gomez Mestre and, and I are co-supervising a PhD, uh, the PhD of uh, Veronica Castaño, who is looking at the transgenerational effects from exposure to pesticides. And we are, uh, we are having very, very promising and very interesting results in this regard, but that's a story for another day. And so with this, uh, I'm not gonna reiterate the, the different conclusions from the different sections in the talk, but I just want to say that I hope to have convinced you that the study of the evolution and ecology of sexual interactions is a fascinating area in, in evolutionary biology, and that there's a lot of work to do in terms of the evolutionary ecology of sexual interactions. 
And so uh, I just want to say thank you to my funding sources, uh, my research group here, uh, my colleagues and collaborators. These are just some of them. And thank you very much for, for listening. And, and I, I will be happy to answer your questions if, if I know how. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paco. It was a super interesting talk. And um, for the moment, we don't have many questions, but I hope that people are going to be encouraged to ask more. So, uh, Ivan, he's asking you, Ivan Gomez Mestre is asking you for the longevity graphs that you show on your two per two experiments, uh, if they are for females or for males. I don't know oh, if yeah. you can come back for the, for the experiments. Yeah. Yeah, they, they are for females. So it's, it's this one, right? So this is a female resistance. So it's looking at the females from the, from the selection lines and how they cope with the damaging effects of mating, okay? When they mate more males from outside the, the selection experience. So it's, it's, that's the way you, you look at female resistance. Imagine you wanted to look at male harm, you would look at the effects of uh, males on the longevity of females that are tested. So in this case, it's females from the selection line, from the selection line mating to test their males and uh, looking at the longevity of females, which is what gives you a, a, a view of the evolution of female resistance. Okay? Okay. So, okay. yeah. yeah. I think it's clear now. So Miguel Fortuna, He's saying, Paco, are you mixing monogamy and polygamy within the metapopulation structure? If so, how could you estimate indirect effects on a particular sexual trait among patches? No, we are not mixing monogamy and polygamy. No, it's, so we are looking at interaction, but each, I mean, uh, let me see. Yeah, here. So each selection regime is either monogamous or polygamous and combine or cross with a selection, uh, with a population structure. So it's not mixing monogamy and polygamy. I don't know if that's the point. One thing that we do, and I didn't mention, is that in, in, in almost every single study in experimental evolution, what you want to test evolution of traits, and if you want to test whether uh, the, the change in the phenotype or the traits you're looking at, uh, there is a genetic basis for that change. You need to do a, a common breeding before testing those traits. So in this test, I didn't mention because otherwise it will be too long, but normally after say, mm, the interaction I show, we did at different generations. One of them was 40, I think 32, 12. Um, but before doing the test, what we do is do this common breeding for one or two generations to uh, remove potential for maternal effects creeping into the results. So you wanna, so you wanna attribute the results to, to genetic differences, not differences that may happen because maybe polyandro females allocate more resources to offspring and so, or monogamous females uh, do whatever. So we bring all, all the females to the same kind of uh, uh, state, apply the same rule. And then we, if we see differences, we can, we can eliminate this maternal or paternal effects. And, and say that these this, this changes are more likely due to, to genetic assimilation. So I'm not sure I understood whether, uh, what Miguel Fortune is trying to, to say here, but we didn't, we didn't mix polygamy and monogamy. Uh, we didn't, no. Okay. Otherwise, say, otherwise it, will be, it will be, I don't know, difficult to, to tell what's going on. Yeah, he says that, okay, that he understood now. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to, to ask a question, question, if you want, Irene. Yes. So, Paco, I have a question about the pet hedging uh, strategy and what you said about extinction risk. So, in a part of your of your talk, you said that the benefits of pet hedging are reduced when there is more connectivity between the populations, right? Yes. But before you said that bed hedging can reduce extinction risk, but the extinction yes. risk increases when your populations are fragmented, which is not exactly the same as metapopulation. You see what I mean? I mean, but 
yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like extreme <laughs> case. So, yes. so I don't yeah, know how to put those two together. Well, that's precisely the point. I mean, when, when you have a fragmentation, uh, populations can become extinct because of the low population sizes and so on. So in, in, in the context of, of a mating system, imagine there are two males and two females mm -hmm. and one of the males is infertile, okay? So if, if there is monogamy, one male produces offspring, if he mates, if okay. he mates with yeah. one male, the other produces zero offspring, so that is gone and there's only one female. Imagine next generation, the offspring is partially infertile. So that's what I mean. I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite, it makes sense. So if, it it, if there's sense. polyandry, oh, yeah. the females are reducing the risk of complete reproductive failure. The behaving is, in the end, it's just, a, it's just a matter of sampling, okay? And by sampling, you reduce uh, the risk of, of complete failure, you know? And so, and this is what really rescues, may rescue the populations, right? Okay. Yeah, um, it makes sense. It makes sense now. Yeah, I didn't understood that, but now okay. that you're explaining it further, it makes sense. And um, so, uh, another question that I have regarding bed hedging is like, um, when you have frequency dependent selection, the strategies, the fitness of the strategies depends on other strategies. So I don't know exactly how bed hedging would be applied there. Mm, how yes. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting point. Uh, but, mm, I don't, I don't see the potential for being a, a big factor here. Okay. But uh, I don't know. It might, it might, yeah, it might play a role. Maybe it, it's a good, good question. I, yeah, we haven't thought about that. There's no nothing in our tests uh, mm -hmm. looking into into that possibility but for sure yeah that's, that's very interesting to consider that okay. yeah. more yeah. i have a very general question that i'm not sure if you answer in the seminar but um how and uh, flexible or i mean the the fact that a female can be polyandrous or uh, mono monoandry is determined by the species or can the same species can change? I mean, if there is a, like a gradient of, uh, of patterns mm -hmm. for, the, for yeah. the same species. Sure, yeah, there is a gradient. I mean, it's, it's quite plastic. I mean, some it's females plastic. tend to be polyandrous, some others uh, tend to be monogamous. Some that are monogamous, maybe some females, if, if they found a better male, they mate with the male. Some other females will tend to mate with lots of males. In other species, polyandry is due because of the male male selection, because males are selected in a way, as I show, because of the difference in potential reproductive rates. There's a lot of selection of males to increase their reproductive success. And maybe females are mating just to avoid costs, not to get benefits, just because it's what, what is called convenience polyandry. So there's a whole range of, uh, of uh, situations and variation. In, and it the, depends as well on the... Uh, ecological settings and it's quite uh, diverse is it that's why it, it's interesting like uh, studying what so what different species are doing and why they are doing it and, and why there's this plasticity when other within species levels okay thank you yeah so, so i don't know if anyone else have another question Madi, do you have more questions no i don't so yeah, so I think if nobody Ivan. else, ah, Ivan, yeah. sorry, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna miss it. A very impressive overview of, this, of your research program regarding the evolution of pet hedging. It usually evolves when cues are not very reliable. Otherwise, plasticity evolves instead. Oh. Yeah, so it's sorry. more a comment, more than a question. <laughs> yeah, could you elaborate on that? Because I don't know if I understand what he means. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think this is right. It's one of the, I mean, this this uh, change, evolutionary change can happen because of uh, adaptive tracking, phenotypic plasticity, or by hedging response. They're, they're kind of the three kind of canonical ways for for this evolutionary change. So, yeah, it's it's all part of the same. In a way, different responses and different ways to 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 uh, to cope with with uh, environmental fluctuation 
And But now, now Larry, he's Larry. A, yeah, sorry, Paco. Now he's asking, would you say, would you say that uh, there is an inverse relationship between the existence of bed hedging and re reliability of sexual traits? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I, I got where he wants to get that. Uh, mm, yeah, I, in a way, I don't know. It was, mm, I'm not sure what, what he means, but uh, I guess he sees the hedging as a kind of, a, yeah, plastic response or a response that evolves when there is some kind of uh, fluctuation. And if you have some kind of deterministic trait or, but I'm not sure that's the question. So I would prefer not to say much about that because I will be saying <laughs> nonsense, probably. <laughs> so maybe I, I, can, I can talk to him. Uh, in person or he could explain it to me or maybe he's writing the question there he could just define it a, a bit more but uh, but uh, also we need to consider by hedging is not only about being plastic and diverse it, the other solution is to be uh, general in a way so this could be like a conservative by hedging or diversified by hedging so both strategies achieve the same the same uh, outcome which is reducing variance so but i don't know as i said i'm not sure this question goes along those lines or or not okay okay i think maybe you can you can discuss more in person but i, I guess for reliability he is referring that the the trade is not an indicator if they the fitness i mean the quality of the mail is high uh, or not yeah so, no, of course i mean if for, for a start I mean, if, if there's an indicator trading males indicating the quality of the males, the females won't need to mate polyandrously. They, if they can really tell which male is best, they will, or they should try to mate with that male, right? So, so in, yeah, that, in that, in that case, in that case, it will be an inverse correlation. The high, the more reliable is a, a trait and the more, the better indicator of a quality the less yeah. necessity of investing in bet hedging. Yes, sure. Yeah, totally right. Yeah, but hedging evolves when there is a unreliable mate choice in that way because females can, cannot see which male is, is uh, good, which male is bad. Okay. So, yeah, 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 completely, 100%, sure. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I, I agree completely. Okay, so good that we understood at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank you so much, Pac. I think nobody else is asking, but it was great. A super intense seminar with the many, many ongoing research. And, and I hope you will have a lot of success with all these questions that are super interesting. So thank you. yeah. Thank you. And, I, 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 yeah, I was gonna say that uh, I know there was a lot of stuff. I probably went too quickly, but uh, my email is in the web and so anyone uh, who wants to do some uh, clarifications or dis discuss something well i'm happy to you know we are happy to talk to them or to answer emails whatever so yeah sure sure i'm don't, sure that people worry. are gonna ask you more. <laughs> okay so <laughs> thank you so much and next week uh, we will have a another seminar by olaya and um, so she's a PhD student here, but you will receive the information about that. So thank you so much and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.